For 22 years, starting officially in 1948, the United States Air Force was responsible for investigating reports of unidentified flying objects. That investigation began with a serious, high-priority status to search for answers. About a year later, those involved created an estimate of the situation. That was an intelligence analysis of the events that had taken place. The conclusion was that the flying saucers were interplanetary craft. The Air Force Chief of Staff, General Hoyt S. Vandenberg, rejected the analysis and nearly everyone involved in its creation found themselves reassigned. The UFO project, then known as SIGN, fell into disarray. After a series of officers had been put in charge and a name changed, first to Grudge, then Blue Book, investigations became a priority. They didn't last very long, and eventually Blue Book became little more than a public relations operation designed to convince the public that the Air Force was doing its job that there was no threat to national security and that there was nothing to the tales of flying saucers. During the Second World War, they were called Foo Fighters, and in 1946, as they flew over Scandinavia, they were known as Ghost Rockets. It wasn't until Boise, Idaho businessman Kenneth Arnold saw them near Mount Rainier, Washington, that they became flying saucers. Although the official investigation wouldn't be launched for another six months, the Arnold sighting was the first one to receive major coverage in the United States. Army Air Force's investigations working out of the 4th Air Force headquarters became deeply involved in the Arnold sighting. Arnold made his sighting of the strange objects flying one behind the other at about 9,500 feet at a speed he estimated to be more than 1,500 miles an hour. This was something that clearly wasn't made in secret projects hidden in the mountains of New Mexico, and it wasn't something that was made by the Soviet Union as they began to press for world domination. This was something strange that had no ready explanation other than it was strange and almost impossible to believe. When Arnold landed later in the afternoon on June 24th in Yakima, Washington, he told the assembled reporters what he had seen. In the course of describing the objects, he said they moved with a motion like that of saucers skipping across the water. The shape, however, according to drawings that Arnold completed for the Army, showed objects that were heel-shaped with a blunt nose. In later drawings, Arnold elaborated, showing objects that were crescent-shaped with a scalloped trailing edge and even a clear canopy over the cockpit. Later, Arnold would provide the military with a written description of the events in a document that was originally classified, but that has long since been released. Arnold wrote, On June 24th, I had finished my work, and about two o'clock I took off for Chehalis, Washington Airport with the intention of going to Yakima, Washington. I flew directly toward Mount Rainier after reaching an altitude of about 9,500 feet, which is the approximate elevation of the high plateau from which Mount Rainier rises. There was a DC-4 to the left and to the rear of me, approximately 15 miles distance, and I should judge a 14,000 foot elevation. I hadn't flown more than two or three minutes on my course when a bright flash reflected on my airplane. It startled me as I thought I was too close to some other aircraft. I looked every place in the sky and couldn't find where the reflection had come from until I looked to the left and the north of Mount Rainier, 
where I observed a chain of nine peculiar-looking aircraft flying from north to the south at approximately 9,500 foot elevation and going, seemingly, in a definite direction of about 170 degrees. They, the objects, were approaching Mount Rainier very rapidly, and I merely assumed they were jet planes. Anyhow, I discovered that this was where the reflection had come from, as two or three of them every few seconds would dip or change their course slightly, just enough for the sun to strike them at an angle that reflected brightly on my plane. I thought it was very peculiar that I couldn't their tails, but assumed they were some type of jet plane. I was determined to clock their speed, as I had two definite points I could clock them by. I watched these objects with great interest, as I had never before observed airplanes flying so close to the mountaintops. I would estimate their elevation could have varied a thousand feet one way or another, up or down. They flew like many times I have observed geese to fly in a rather diagonal chain-like line, as if they were linked together. Their speed at the time did not impress me particularly, because I knew that our army and air forces had planes that went very fast. A number of newsmen and experts suggested that I might have been seeing reflections, or even a mirage. This I know to be absolutely false, as I observed these objects not only through the glass of my airplane, but turned my airplane sideways where I could open my window and observe them with a completely unobstructed view. When these objects were flying approximately straight and level, there were just a black, thin line, and when they flipped was the only time I could get a judgment as to their size. Arnold's sightings didn't gain front page status immediately. Stories about it appeared in newspapers a day or two later, usually on page 8 or 9, and then with a comment about strange objects in fast flight. It was, at that time, the story of an oddity. Arnold claimed later that he thought he had seen some sort of new jet aircraft, and he was a little concerned about breaking the security around it. In the Project Blue Book files is a note about the Arnold case, which labeled it as Incident Number 37. The Air Force officers who reviewed the case wrote, The report cannot bear even superficial examination, therefore must be disregarded. There are strong indications that this report and its attendant publicity is largely responsible for subsequent reports. Note content with a negative note in the file. The unidentified officer also wrote, It is to be noted that the observer has profited from his story by selling it to Fate magazine. Here for the first time were two accusations that would be made about many UFO cases. That is, the witnesses were in it for the money and a suggestion that UFO reports were the result of the snowball effect. It seems to suggest that Arnold invented his tale with an eye to writing a story about it for fate. There is no evidence to support this, and Arnold had not written any articles for any magazines prior to this sighting. The editors of Fate, and Ray Palmer specifically, who would become one of the first and most vocal proponents of the flying saucers, induced Arnold into writing about what he had seen. The point then becomes irrelevant. The article doesn't seem to have been a motive for Arnold, but more of a serendipitous reward for seeing and reporting the objects in the first place. It seems that those investigating the flying saucers didn't see a link between his sighting and photographs taken on July 7, 1947 in Phoenix, Arizona. William A. Rhodes, a self-employed scientist living in Phoenix, claimed he had taken what might be considered the first good photographs of one of the flying saucers. Initially puzzled by the case, the military did take the report seriously. The investigation that included the FBI, whose agent asked not to be identified as an FBI agent, accompanied the Army Air Force's officer 
to interview Rhodes. Rhodes would first tell reporters and then various government investigators, including those from the FBI and the Army's Counterintelligence Corps, that he had been on his way to his workshop at the rear of his house when he heard a distinctive whoosh that he believed to be from a P-80 Shooting Star fighter jet, which was the fastest airplane at that particular moment. Overhead, he saw something that didn't have the shape of a conventional aircraft. He hurried to his lab, grabbed his camera from his workbench, and hurried outside to a small mound in his backyard. Rhodes sighted along the side of his camera and took the first photograph. He estimated that the object was circling in the east. He advanced the film and then hesitated, thinking that he would wait for the object to get closer. Worried that it would disappear without coming closer, he snapped the second picture, finished the film roll, and his ability to record the event further. Rhodes' story, along with the pictures, appeared in the Phoenix newspaper, The Arizona Republic, on July 9th. In that article, men long experienced in aircraft recognition studied both the print and the negative from which they were made and declined to make a guess on what the flying object might be. Rhodes said that the object appeared to be elliptical in shape and to have a diameter of 20 to 30 feet. It appeared to be at 5,000 feet when first seen and was traveling, according to Rhodes, at 400 to 600 miles per hour. It was gray, which tended to blend with the gray overcast background of the sky. The object had, according to Rhodes and a confidential report from the Project Blue Book files, what appeared to be a cockpit canopy in the center, which extended toward the back and beneath the object. The cockpit did not protrude from the surface, but was clearly visible with the naked eye. Then on August 29th, according to a memorandum from the office in charge, George Fugate, Jr., a special agent of the CIC and stationed at 4th Air Force Headquarters, interviewed Rhodes in person. Fugate was accompanied by Special Agent Brower of the Phoenix FBI office. This interview is important because of some of the confusion about location of the negatives and prints of the photograph that would develop later. During the interview, Rhodes again told the story, suggesting that he thought, at first, it might have been the Navy's Flying Flapjack, which had been featured on the May 1947 cover of Mechanic Illustrated. He rejected the idea because he saw no propellers or landing gear, though the overall shape of the craft matched that of the flapjack. Later, research by various investigators, both military and civilian, showed that the Navy built two flapjacks, but neither had flown outside the Bridgeport, Connecticut area. The project was canceled in 1947 as the Navy moved to jet-powered aircraft. While Rhodes was being interviewed in his home in Phoenix, Arnold, because he lived in the Northwest, Lieutenant Frank Brown with Captain William Davidson took a B-25 and flew up to Tacoma, Washington, where Arnold was investigating Murray Island. They all got together in Arnold's hotel room late in the evening where Arnold showed them the debris that had been recovered on Murray Island. That Dolly and Crimson had given him. Both Army officers, Brown and Davison, believed that the material was nothing more than smelter slag. They were unimpressed, but both men respected Arnold. They didn't tell him they believed the Mari Island tell to be a hoax. All of this takes us back to Rhodes. According to Early, Arnold asked the two officers what Army intelligence had learned about UFOs in the days after his sighting. Davidson sat down and then drew a picture of an object. He told Arnold, this is a drawing of one of several photographs we consider to be authentic. 
Brown then added the information that tied it to the Rhodes photograph. He said, it came from Phoenix, Arizona the other day. We have prints of it at Hamilton Field, but the original negatives were flown to Washington, D.C. It is clear that those pictures were the ones that Rhodes had taken since there were no other UFO photographs taken in July 1947 in Phoenix, Arizona. It's interesting that Brown mentioned Hamilton Field because Rhodes does the same thing and Hamilton Field was part of the 4th Air Force in 1947 and Rhodes had communications with officers at 4th Air Force about his photograph as well. In the end, the Air Force decided that Arnold had been fooled by mirages created as the wind whipped up the snow at the highest levels of the mountain. Rhodes had created a hoax, no real evidence of that, but when they had no other explanation, they claimed the sighting was a hoax. What they couldn't explain and didn't try was how Rhodes could photograph an object that looked like that reported by Arnold without having seen the Arnold illustrations. The belief at the beginning of the official investigation was that trained military personnel and law enforcement officers made the best, most credible witnesses. Using this criteria, they selected a number of reports that seemed inexplicable to them and that seemed to suggest that the observed craft were beyond the technical capability of any nation on Earth. On July 4, 1947, there were a series of sightings over several Northwest states that Air Force officers labeled as either insufficient data for a scientific analysis or as unidentified. These involved police officers and airline flight crews, as well as local civilians. Many of the reports were independent of one another, but can be linked by location, time of day, and other factors. Combined rather than separated, they make a powerful statement about the nature of the flying saucers. Although the first reports were made by civilians, it was just a few minutes after 1 p.m. that police officer Kenneth A. McDowell, who was near the Portland police station, noticed that the pigeons began fluttering as if frightened. Overhead, he saw five large disks east of the city. According to the report he gave to military officers, three disks were flying east and two were headed to the south. All were flying at high speed and all appeared to be oscillating. McDowell alerted other police officers in an all-car alert and they immediately broadcast the information over the police radio. Two other police officers, Walter A. Lissy and Robert Ellis, after hearing the broadcast, stopped near a park. Overhead, they saw three discs moving at high speed. Neither heard any sound, but both did see flashes of brightness that could have been sunlight reflecting from a metallic surface. According to them, the objects moved erratically and changed their direction of flight. They were in sight for about 30 seconds. Both men were veterans of the Second World War, and both were civilian pilots, which suggested they had some experience around aviation and aviation assets. Patrolman Earl Patterson, after hearing the broadcast, stopped to search for any of the disks. The broadcast had suggested that the saucers were coming out of the sun, which meant they were coming from the direction of the sun. At first, Patterson noticed nothing, but a few seconds later, he saw one object coming out of the west and heading towards the southwest. He said that the craft seemed to be either aluminum or eggshell white and didn't flash or reflect the sun. He also said that he didn't think they were airplanes like so many of the others, their flight path was erratic 
wobbling and weaving. Patterson thought they were radio controlled rather than having a living pilot on board. On the far side of the Columbia River in nearby Vancouver, Washington, Sheriff's deputies Sergeant John Sullivan, Clarence McKay, and Fred Knives also heard the alert broadcast and ran outside to look for themselves. Over Portland, three to five miles away, they saw 20 to 30 discs that looked to them like a flight of geese. They heard a low humming sound which might or might not have been related to the objects. Not long after that, three harbor patrolmen who had also been monitoring the police radio band stepped outside. Captain K.A. Prynne, A.T. Ostrid, and Patrolman Casey Hoff saw three to six discs traveling at high speed. They couldn't get a good count on the number because of the bright flashes surrounding them. According to witnesses, the objects looked like huge chrome hubcaps and oscillated as they flew. Sometimes the witnesses could see a full disc, then a half moon, and then nothing at all. They did see a plane overhead as well, but all the witnesses said that what they were watching was not aircraft. This would cause Air Force investigations to wonder if aircraft might be a plausible explanation for the sightings, despite the suggestion by the witness. They thought that something the plane's pilot did, such as tossing shiny disks from the cockpit, might have caused the confusion, and later in the day, there was another report with a similar claim. The Air Force files contained a report that a former Air Corps veteran said the object he saw was unlike any plane he'd ever seen. He thought it appeared radio controlled because the disc could change direction at a 90 degree angle without difficulty. Another witness suggested that he had seen three objects fly east across the Willamette River the objects did not appear to be very high, but they were traveling very fast. He said that they looked like a metallic disc glinting in the sun. He also said that he and a neighbor saw a single disc later that afternoon. About 4 p.m., more civilians reported more discs. A woman called the police telling them she had watched a single object as shiny as a new dime flipping around. An unidentified man called to say that he had seen three discs, one flying to the east and the two heading north. They were shiny, shaped like flattened saucers, and were traveling at high speed. About an hour later, a man said that he spotted two white or silver objects flying southeast over Portland. Half an hour later, he sighted a single disc headed to the northeast. In Milwaukee, Oregon, not far from Portland, Sergeant Claude Cross reported three objects flying to the north. All were disc-shaped. All were moving at high speed. But discs overhead were the only things being reported. There were objects falling from the sky as well. Near Eugene, Oregon, a railroad cashier said he saw silver discs being dropped out of a light plane flying over the city. A man in Portland recovered a large piece of paper he had seen fall from a great height. According to reports, the time that the paper fell coincided with some of the flying saucer sightings, which might explain some of them. The best of the sightings, and the one that was labeled as unidentified, occurred about dusk as a United Airlines flight crew saw a single disc. Minutes later, they spotted several others. Captain E.J. Smith, the captain of the flight, explained it this way. As our flight number 105 took off from Boise, Idaho at 9.04 p.m. Pacific time, the tower joshingly warned us to be on the lookout for flying saucers. My co-pilot, Ralph Stevens, was in control shortly after we got into the air. Suddenly, he switched on the landing lights. 
He said he thought he saw an aircraft approaching us head on. I noticed the objects then for the first time. We saw four or five somethings. One was larger than the rest and, for the most part, kept off the right of the other three or four similar but smaller objects. Since we were flying northwest, roughly into the sunset, we saw whatever they were in at least partial light. We saw them clearly. We followed them in a northwesterly direction for about 45 miles. Then I called the attendant at the Ontario Oregon radio tower, giving an approximate location and course for the objects. The attendant acknowledged our call, went outside to look, but was unable to see anything like what we described. Finally, the object disappeared in a burst of speed. We were unable to tell whether they outsped us or disintegrated. We were never able to catch them in our DC-3. Our airspeed at the time was 185 miles per hour. Through the Boise Air Tower, we radioed another United plane to see if it had seen anything. That plane, flying eastbound into the night, had not sighted them. Because we were following the objects at roughly the same altitude, we can't say anything about their shape except they were thin and were smooth on the bottom and rough appearing on the top. Smith called the flight attendant, Marty Morrow, to the cockpit to, in Smith's words, verify they were actually seeing the disks. He saw four or more disks, three clustered together and a fourth flying off in the distance by itself. The objects were in sight for 10 to 15 minutes, which means that she was able to get a good look at them. Not everyone was convinced that the sightings were of unconventional aircraft. Colonel G.R. Dodson, a commander in the Oregon National Guard, told reporters that he had made an inspection of the area from the air, but that he had found nothing suspicious. Solutions were offered by some of the local residents. One thought that the sightings were the result of cottonwood blossoms drifting on the wind. Another complained about the news coverage, believing it all to be a hoax. He said that he had seen an airplane fly over, and about a minute later he saw what he believed to be bits of aluminum foil that might have been cigarette wrappers. Air Force officers mentioned that radar chaff had been seen in the area, but offered no evidence to back up the claim. The idea that a private plane pilot was dropping small silver disks took on greater importance. In the only news story that might have been of importance, the Oregon Journal noted that the only known airplanes in the area at the time of the reports were 23 B-29 bombers near Astoria. A formation of that size would have been difficult to misidentify, not to mention that the roar that the engines would have caused. Dr. James McDonald, an atmospheric scientist, interviewed Smith, the United Airlines captain, about his sighting. In a prepared statement to United States House of Representatives Committee on Science and Astronautics Symposium of the Unidentified Flying Objects in July 1968, McDonald reported, Smith emphasized to me that there were no cloud phenomena to confuse them here, and that they observed these objects long enough to be quite certain that they were no conventional aircraft. They appeared flat on the bottom, rounded on the top, he told me. And he added that there seems to be a perceptible roughness of some sort on top, uh, though he could not refine the description. Almost immediately after they lost sight of the first five, the second formation of four, three in a line and a fourth off to the side, moved in ahead of their position, again traveling westward but at a somewhat higher altitude than the DC-3's 8,000 feet. These passed quickly out of sight to the west at speeds which they felt were far beyond then known speeds. Smith emphasized that they were never certain of sizes and distances, but that they had the general impression that these disc-like craft were appreciably larger than ordinary aircraft. Smith emphasized that he had not taken seriously the previous week's news accounts that coined the since persistent term flying saucer. But after seeing this total of nine unconventional high-speed wingless craft on the evening of July 4th, 1947, 
he became much more interested in the matter. Nevertheless, in talking with me, he stressed that he would not speculate on the real nature or origin. These reports were investigated by Army officers at the time, though the reports seemed to be fairly superficial. That is, there were objects seen high in the sky for seconds or a minute or two. As part of the Project Grudge final report written in 1949, one of the officers wrote, This investigation can offer no definitive hypothesis, but in passing would like to note the incidents occurred on the 4th of July and that if relatively small pieces of aluminum foil had been dropped from a plane over the area, then any one object would be visible at a relatively short distance. Even moderate wind velocities would give the illusion that fluttering gyrating disks had gone by at great velocities. Various observers would not, of course, in this case, have seen the same objects. The officer also noted that the above is not to be regarded as a very likely explanation, but only as a possibility. The occurrence on these incidents on July 4th may have been more than coincidence, some prankster might have tossed such objects out of an airplane as part of an Independence Day celebration. The thing that the Air Force did here was link the case by date and location, but didn't think of them as a continuation of one sighting. Once a police officer had alerted his fellow officers to the objects, they, in different locations and at different times, went outside or looked up and were able to spot them. The descriptions are of a similar type, dish-shaped object, flying alone or in formations. That they were seeing the same thing from different locations suggested something that was very high or that there was more than one formation. The thing to be remembered that even if the police officers in the one location were fooled by something, those officers observing it from a different perspective might have been able to identify it. If there was a terrestrial explanation, since that didn't happen, it would seem that there was something very strange going on here. Add to this the sighting by Smith and his airline crew, which we can do because they observed the craft on the same day and in the same general location. We have a new dimension to the case. Smith's report was labeled unidentified, meaning that he and his crew were able to give a detailed description of what they had seen. We have to wonder if that was because they were met by reporters when he landed. Had his report not received the attention it did, and had he not provided the detail he did, might it have ended up with only a little information and a label of insufficient data for scientific analysis. Army Air Force's investigation, which took the report seriously in the summer of 1947, failed to find a satisfactory explanation for these sightings. It should be remembered that in this case, there was nothing other than witness testimony, witnesses who were separated by distance, but who in some cases had been warned about the flying saucers by the police radio, and who had claimed to have seen basically the same thing. These sightings are interesting, and we have to wonder what more might have been learned had a little more effort been made in the investigation of them. Although it has been said there is a single case in the Blue Book files in which alien creatures were reported that wasn't labeled as some sort of psychological program, there are several good cases hidden in there. Skeptics, disbelievers, and debunkers like to say that there is no evidence that alien creatures have visited the planet. They ignore, reject, or are unaware that the Blue Book files do contain examples of physical evidence that has been recovered. The best of those cases came from Socorro, New Mexico on April 24, 1964. Lonnie Zamora, 
then a police officer in Socorro, saw a landed object and two small humanoids standing near it. According to Project Blue Book, Zamora was chasing a speeder when he heard a loud roar and saw a flash of light in the southwestern sky. Fearing that a dynamite shed on the edge of town might have exploded, Zamora broke off the chase and headed in that direction. Captain Hector Quintanella added more detail to the story as it was told by Zamora during the official investigation. Quintanella later wrote, It was off the road to the left in the arroyo, and at first glance it looked like a car turned over, but when he drove closer it appeared to be aluminum clay, not chrome, and oval shaped like a football. Zamora drove about 50 feet along the hill crest, radioing back to the sheriff's office. 1044, meaning accident. I'll be 106, meaning busy out of the car. Checking a wreck down in the Arroyo, Zamora said. From this point, seated in the car, he could not see the object over the edge of the hill. As he stopped the car, he was still talking on the radio, and while he was getting out, he dropped his mic. He picked it up and put it back and started down towards the object. Zamora then said, As soon as I saw flames and heard roar, ran away from object, but did turn head towards object. Object was in shape. It was smooth, no windows or doors. As roar started, it was still on the ground. Quintanella said, I was determined to solve the case, and come hell or high water, I was going to find the vehicle or the stimulus. I decided that it was imperative for me to talk to the base commander at Holloman Air Force Base, I wanted to interview the base commander at length about special activities from his base. I needed help to pull this off, so I called Lieutenant Colonel Maston Jacks at SAFOI. I told him what I wanted to do and he asks, do you think it will do any good? I replied, God damn it, Maston, if there is an answer to this case, it has to be in some hangar at Holloman. He went to work with his position at the Pentagon, and the approval for his visit came through. Colonel Gehrman was the base commander during his visit. He was most cooperative and told me that I could go anywhere and visit any activity which interested me. I went from one end of the base to the other. I spent four days talking to everybody I could and spent almost a whole day with the downrange controllers at the White Sands Missile Range. I left Holloman dejected and convinced that the answer to Zamora's experience did not originate and terminate at this base. On my way back to Wright-Patterson, I hit upon an idea. Why not a lunar landing vehicle? I knew that some research had been done at Wright-Patterson, so as soon as I got back, I asked for some briefings. The briefings were extremely informative, but the lunar landers were not operational in April of 1964. I got the names of the companies that were doing research in this field, and I started writing letters. The companies were most cooperative, but their answers were all negative. I labeled the case unidentified, and the UFO buffs and hobby clubs had themselves a field day. According to them, there was proof that our beloved planet had been visited by an extraterrestrial vehicle. Although I labeled the case unidentified, I've never been satisfied with that classification. It has been claimed that the only case involving occupants Creatures associated with a landed UFO that was labeled as unidentified was that from Socorro, New Mexico. Although somewhat hidden in the Project Blue Book files, there is another that took place almost two years later. Heinick mentioned it in his book, The Heinick UFO Report, but he doesn't give a location, and he dates it with a newspaper clipping from the Dallas Times-Herald. 
Although Hynek suggests the case is from the Wichita Falls, Texas area, and the witness, W.E. Laxon, was a civilian employee at Shepard Air Force Base in Wichita Falls, the government files list the case as Temple, Oklahoma. The newspaper clipping cited by Hynek is dated March 27, 1966, but the sighting occurred on March 23, 1966. With the misdirection from Hynek, probably as a result of the classified nature of the case when he wrote his book, it took a while to deduce the facts. Hynek, using the newspaper account, said there was nothing in it that varied from what was in the government file. That file said, Observer W.E. Eddie Laxon was driving his car along the highway at approximately 5.05 a.m. on the 23rd of March, 1966, when he noticed an object parked on the road in front of him. He stopped the car and got out so to get a better view of the object. The object was so parked that it blocked out a portion of the road curb sign. There were no sharp edges noted by the observer. The object had the appearance of a conventional aircraft, a C-124, without wings or motors. There was a plexiglass bubble on top, similar to a B-26 canopy. As the observer approached, he noticed a man wearing a baseball cap enter the object by steps from the bottom. After the man entered the object, it began to rise from the pavement and headed on a southeasterly direction at approximately 720 miles per hour. The object had forward and aft lights that were very bright. As the object rose from the ground, a high-speed drill type of sound was heard, plus a sound like that of a welding rod when an arc is struck. The object was 75 feet long, about 8 feet from the top to the bottom, and about 12 feet wide. There were some type of supports on the bottom of the object. After the object disappeared, the witness got back into his car and drove approximately 15 miles down the highway. At this time, the original witness stopped and talked with another individual who had also stopped along the roadway to watch some lights over Red River, which is approximately five or six miles to the southeast. Various organizations were contacted around the Temple, Oklahoma area for a possible experimental or conventional aircraft. The observer stated that he thought the object was some type of Army or Air Force research aircraft. All attempts at such an explanation proved fruitless since there were no aircraft in the area at the time of the sightings. Although there are numerous helicopter and other experimentals in the area, none could be put in the area of Temple at approximately 5 o'clock on the 23rd of March 1966. Because of this factor, the case is listed as unidentified by the Air Force. The second witness who was not interviewed by the Air Force and who, according to the government file, did not fill out their long and involved form was C.W. Anderson. Anderson confirmed for the newspaper that he had seen the craft as well. He told the reporter, I know that people will say that Laxon is darn crazy, but that's what I saw. Anderson said that he thought the object had been following him down the road. He had watched it in his rearview mirror for several miles. The problem for the Air Force was that Anderson did not complete their form. He didn't see the pilot or crewman either. The drawing of the object made by Laxon resembled that which Lonnie Zamora had made of the craft he had saw, which means it was sort of egg-shaped. It was certainly longer and was lying on its side. Like Zamora, Zaxon said that he saw symbols on the object, but unlike Zamora, he recognized them. He told the report that on the side I made out TLA with the last two figures 38. In what might be described as a fit of honesty, the Air Force admitted they had no solution for the case. The description of the alien was more human than humanoid, and he seemed to be dressed in conventional clothing right to the mechanic's hat. 
Investigations revealed a second witness and that might have influenced the Air Force, especially since the men had never met prior to the sighting. In the end, they labeled the case as unidentified. In a review of government records, another case, also labeled as unidentified, was found. This one took place in Pittsburgh, Kansas. The case is a single witness and has gone nearly unreported for more than 60 years. William Squires was on his way to work along Highway 160 about eight miles from Pittsburgh when he sighted an unknown object hovering over a field. It was about 27 feet in length and about 12 feet high. Squires thought it had the appearance of an airfoil. He said that he saw small propellers around the perimeter. They were about a foot in diameter. There were also a number of windows in the craft, and through one of them, Squires could see a man who seemed to be controlling the object. He was facing forward to the edge of the object. The windows were described as blue, becoming darker as time passed. This seems to be the type of sighting the Air Force would dismiss as psychological, which would be a nice way of saying that it was a hoax and there was something wrong with the witness. However, there was some physical evidence left behind, according to the government file. The object reported as hovering over an open field used for cattle grazing. General area under the exact location was pressed down and formed a round 60-foot diameter impression with the grass in a recognizable concentric pattern. Loose grass lay on top of the impression as if drawn in by suction when the object ascended vertically at a high speed. Vegetation and grass approximately three to four inches high. Area was extremely dry at present. Grass showed where Squires had walked in to a fence and stopped. L. V. Baxter and D. Widner, local employees of KOMA, went to the place of the sighting, 1135 CST, with Squires and confirmed his path to the fence and the 60-foot diameter impression in the tall grass. Robert E. Greens visited the site at 1600 on the 25th of August of 1952 with source and reports that the vegetation was laid down in concentric circles but with the impression less distinct than reported by Widener and Baxter. Green obtained grass and soil samples of the immediate area where the impression was made and also gathered control samples 200 yards removed from the site. He is sending some to the Air Technical Intelligence Center Airmail Special Delivery. What is strange about this case is the fact that there seemed to be little interest in the pilot of the craft. Although there is another point where he was discussed, there's no real addition to the information. Clearly, based on these descriptions, that alien was human, or human enough to be indistinguishable from a human. Squires did suggest that the occupant seemed to be frenzied in his activities inside the craft. Although this case is essentially single witness, there was the physical evidence left by the craft. Others, Baxter, Whitener, and Green, did see the impressions in the ground left by the craft. Eventually, this sort of evidence would become known as a saucer next meaning simply that the crushed vegetation left by a UFO on the ground had somewhat similar features to other parts of the country and other parts of the world. The ultimate description would be of a crop circle. Here, rather than an elaborate design, it was a simple circle of crushed or flattened grass. The soil samples taken by Green were analyzed by the Air Force. In a short report of a single paragraph, the technician said they had found no radiation, burning, or stress of any kind. In other words, there was nothing to the sample to distinguish those taken from the landing area or from those taken 200 yards away. There is one final aspect to the case that is mildly interesting. 
In a couple of the letters from the government files, there is a notation that reminds all of paragraph 7, which is a paragraph in the regulations that requires unidentified cases be classified. Those who have information about the case are not allowed to discuss it with those who do not have the proper clearances. J. Allen Hynek, writing in the Hynek UFO Report, provides a glimpse into the thinking at Blue Book at the time of this sighting. He wrote, My skepticism was so great at that time that I was quite willing to dismiss it as a hallucination. Even with that admitted bias against the case, which never received wide exposure, is another which the witness said that he had seen the pilot of an unidentified craft and that was left as unidentified by the Air Force. In their zeal to label cases, this seems to be another that they missed. They could have easily labeled it as psychological, if not for the darned landing traces. Keeping with their tradition of labeling cases but not solving them, the Air Force officers decided that witnesses had psychological problems if they claimed to have seen the beings outside of their craft. There is no need to investigate if the witness is unreliable or under the influence of some kind of mental problem. In the Pittsburgh, Kansas case, there is the same problem. Here was a case in which the object interacted with the environment. True, it was a single witness, but it left marks on the ground. Rather than send in someone to review it carefully, the Air Force allowed samples to be gathered by a civilian. They may have provided some guidance, but it would seem that an expert with the proper training should have been sent if the Air Force was serious about investigating UFOs. There is another aspect to this case, and that is that a military officer did gather some of the data. Green was apparently a second lieutenant in the Army Reserve. He is the man who collected the samples. But this is not to suggest that his military training had covered that. But his membership in the Reserve caused one problem. The report he filed with his chain of command made its way eventually to the Air Force but they delayed it. Zamora seemed to be a single witness, but there was physical evidence left behind. Here, the Air Force responded quickly, gathering evidence, and analyzed the situation. They found no answer that satisfied them. There is the possibility that there were two witnesses. They appeared after the fact, but are not from the Sakaro area, and their stories seem to have been embellished with facts from news reports. In fact, in all the cases, there was some physical evidence to be examined. The cases did not rest solely on the testimony of the witnesses. If there wasn't some kind of physical evidence, there was another witness to corroborate the sightings. The Cisco Grove Occupant Report is just one more example of an opportunity that was missed, or rather, one that seems to have been missed. There was some corroborative testimony from the other hunters, there was the damage to the arrows, and then there was the report that the area had been cleaned. What we don't know is who had been out in the forest cleaning the areas in which the witness claimed to have seen the alien beings. Just who could have done that? There is evidence that not all sightings made it to Project Blue Book, even though the regulations seem to require that. Dr. J. Allen Hynek, who was a scientific consultant to Project Blue Book for many years, often said that the really good cases didn't make it into the Blue Book files. He suspected another reporting system but he couldn't prove that there was one. Hints about this other investigation came from Brigadier General Arthur Exxon, who was the base commander at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in the mid-1960s. 
Exxon said that while he was base commander, he would periodically receive telephone calls which ordered him to prepare an aircraft for a mission outside the local Wright-Patterson area. Exxon himself described this in May 19 of 1991 in a recorded interview. He said, I know that while I was there, I had charge of all the administrative airplanes and had to sign priority airplanes to the members who would go out and investigate reported sightings. I remember several out in Wyoming and Montana and that area in the 60s, 64 and 65. I knew there were certain teams of people that representing headquarters United States Air Force as well as the organizations there at Wright Pad and so on. When a crew came back, it was their own business. Nobody asked any questions. He expanded on this saying, the way this happened to me is that I would get a call and say that the crew or team was leaving. There was such and such a time and they wanted an airplane and pilots to take X number of people to wherever. They might be gone two or three days or might be gone a week. They would come back and that would be the end of it. Asked about the overall control of the teams, Exxon said, I always thought they were part of that unholy crew in Washington that started keeping the lid on this thing. Everything said to this point suggests that the operation was run from FTD, the parent organization to Blue Book at Wright-Patterson. But in an interview conducted about a month later on June the 18th of 1991, Exxon clarified what he had meant. Asked if these teams of 8 to 15 people were stationed at Wright-Patterson, he said they were. They would come from Washington, D.C. They had asked for an airplane tomorrow morning and that would give the guys a chance to get there, Wright-Patterson, by commercial airline. Sometimes they'd be gone for three days and sometimes they'd be gone for a week. I know they went to Montana and Wyoming and the Northwest states a number of times in a year and a half. They went to Arizona once or twice. He also said our contact was a man, a telephone number. He'd call, he'd set the airplane up. I just knew there was an investigative team. What all this boils down to is an attempt to cover the activity. The team, whoever they were, would fly into Dayton, Ohio on commercial air and then drive out to the base. If a reporter attempted to trace the movements of the team after it had been deployed, the trail led back to Wright-Patterson. After that, it just disappeared. This team, or those teams, was made up of 8 to 15 individuals at a time when Project Blue Book was composed of two Air Force officers, an NCO, and a secretary. They were stationed at Wright-Patterson, but these other teams were assigned somewhere else, and there is no reason to assume that all members of a team were assigned to the same base. They would come together as needed. On October 20th, 1969, Brigadier General C.H. Bolander provided the documentation to prove that there was another investigation. In paragraph four of his memo, Bolander wrote, as early as 1953, the Robertson panel concluded that the evidence presented on unidentified flying objects shows no indication that these phenomena constitute a direct physical threat to national security. In spite of this finding, the Air Force continued to maintain a special reporting system. There is still, however, no evidence that Project Blue Book reports have served any intelligence function. Moreover, reports of unidentified flying objects which could affect national security are made in accordance with JANAP 146, the Joint Army-Navy Air Force publication, or Air Force Manual 5511, and are not part of the Blue Book system. In other words, 
The suspicions of Hynek and Exxon were confirmed by this document from the government files. This organization dealt with matters of national security and the sighting at Maelstrom because of the missile shutdown, and it was a matter of national security. Those sightings and the information collected about them would not be part of the Blue Book system and therefore would not be in the files. That they are missing is the significant point. In the beginning, in the summer of 1947, the military was concerned about the sightings of flying saucers. They didn't know what they were, but the reports from military pilots, civilian pilots, and police officers concerned them. They believed the reports to be accurate and thought they represented an advancement in technology by our competitors in the world. Alien visitation, though discussed, was not the top explanation. When the official investigation, known officially as Project Sign, the officers assigned were motivated to find an explanation. In July 1948, they produced a document known as the Estimate of the Situation. According to Ed Rupert, one-time chief of Project Blue Book, that situation was flying saucers and the conclusion was that they were from another world. The Air Force Chief of Staff, General Hoyt S. Vandenberg, rejected the estimate, and those who had been responsible found themselves with new jobs. The fire went out of the investigation. No longer did they worry about the explanation. They just worried about providing solutions for the cases. Sign eventually evolved into Grudge, and then Project Blue Book. For a brief period, Blue Book was more interested in the truth than in explaining cases regardless of the facts. An explanation of the Blue Book files, a reinvestigation of many of the cases, reveals the flaws in them. There are radar cases, physical evidence cases, photographic cases, landing cases, and reports of humanoid creatures that have no solid terrestrial explanations. The truth is that for most of its existence, Blue Book was a public relations operation designed to convince people that there were no flying saucers, no alien visitation, and finally, no reason for continued research. Blue Book ended in 1969, after the University of Colorado accepted more than a half million dollars to investigate UFOs. There were three caveats. They must say something positive about the Air Force investigation. They must conclude their investigation the way the Air Force wanted, and then must show that there was no national security threat. With these three goals accomplished, the Air Force said they were through investigating flying saucers. Like so much else, that statement was also untrue. Ten, nine, ignition sequence start. Six, five, four.